Well, welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Here's truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck. And of course, that means some smart talk radio uh, is in your future. And this segment, uh, no exception. We're going to have some fun here. Uh, with a very, very talented, articulate, erudite, on and on and on woman named Mary Norris. Who is Mary Norris? Here's what she is. Uh, this is what, this is the publicity line we got here. It says she began working at the New Yorker in 78. She's originally from Cleveland, Ohio. She lives in New York, and this is her first book. Um, we can do a little better than that. I can embellish it a little bit. At, at age 15, she started a career as a foot checker at a public pool for 75 bucks a week. Down the line, she attended University of Vermont under fellowship, and uh, she also drove a milk truck uh, for a local dairy uh, for a few months in 1975, and she also was a cashier at Corvette Discount Store back in her past. So much in between and so much going on now. Uh, we are very happy to have her here. Mary Norris, how are you, my friend? Hello. I'm fine. Thank you. You have a long and storied career in retailing and human services, and suddenly you find yourself <laughs> editing The New Yorker. Uh, quite a transition for you. Well, it was actually all of those little jobs were packed into my youth. I guess I got the job when I was about at the job at The New Yorker. I was just turning 26 in 1978. And I'd already done the, you know, the foot checking was not what you would call a career move. I was just very eager to be financially independent when I was a teenager. And I always needed money, so I was always willing to take a job. And those good jobs, like a job on the editorial staff at the New Yorker, they don't come easy. So I had to be persistent and pursue that. And I did what I had to do in the meantime. That was when I worked at Corvette's the storied discount store on Fifth Avenue, and also when I washed dishes in Patterson, New Jersey. And I did a lot of odd jobs. You never ba- did, you, did you ever babysit ever? As a teenager, yes. But I had a rival in the neighborhood who had a lot of younger siblings, so <laughs> she was a more <laughs> highly desirable babysitter than I was. I got the jobs that she rejected. <laughs> Well, well, let's do this. Let's uh, share with our. Let's give you a little bit better setup here. Tell us exactly the the work that you do, and did at the New Yorker. Tell us about that, and and then we'll start. We'll dive back into the work called Between You and Me. Okay. Well, I am what is known at the New Yorker as a page okayer, and that is also called a query proofreader. It's a copy editor who takes a piece through to the printer when it's going to press. Um, We have here different job descriptions than probably any other publisher does. A copy editor goes over the piece when it first is set up for the printer and makes the spellings conform to New Yorker style and also a little bit the punctuation. And then somebody in our department does what is called a Gould reading. That's G-O-U-L-D. It's a verb that came from a woman named Eleanor Gould, who used to read everything in galley, and she was she was erudite. Believe me, if she knew I was going, if if she knew I was giving interviews about copy editing, she'd probably faint. Anyway, she's gone now, so there are a few of us who do this what we call Gould reading, which is a more thorough scrubbing of a piece. That, um, that we do before the piece is even scheduled necessarily, although usually it is already scheduled. Things move at a pretty good clip here. And then once the piece is scheduled and it's going to be in the magazine that week, we read the piece again. We, sp- we split up the contents of the magazine among about six or seven copy editors, proofreaders, okayers, and... For instance, if three big pieces are running in the magazine, you know, we'll take, we'll, three of us will each take one of them, and maybe we have time also to read um, a, a review, a department in the critics department, a column in the critics department, a book review, or cinema, or a piece of fiction. So we read it, we give a, we read it twice. Every time I read something, I try to read it twice, because the first time you're reading for information, 
And the second time, you're really able to see better what you missed the first time. And every time you read it, you see something different anyway. So we read it in and give it to the editor, and then we read it. And then the editor puts on changes from, from the copy editors, from the fact checkers, from the author, and from other editors here who weigh in, and, of course, the editor's own changes. So when you read it again, you have to make sure that all those changes that came from other places are still copy edited by New Yorker style and that they haven't created a conflict or a mistake somewhere else. And then we go through that process again. Do you do any of this, any of this, with a piece of paper in your hand or is it all done on a computer screen? I do most of it with a pencil on paper. That's uh, it's. Are you considered a throwback? And they go, oh, there she goes again. We've got to take it from her analog style. Uh, or, or are people still doing that these days? Well, in this office, it still goes on. The copy editors, the proofreaders, you know, it's not that we're total Luddites. Later on in the process, we switch to the screen because all of publishing now, I believe, is a desktop operation, right? But my first reading, I use a pencil on paper in the galley. Same with the second reading. All of us, before the piece goes to press, the editor, the fact checker, the proofreader, we sit down together over copies on paper of the piece, and we go over them together. And uh, what my job is is to collate all those changes from those different sources onto one clean proof, which we call the reader's copy. And then I put, I enter all those changes into the electronic file. And then somebody, you know, that we have what we call it the makeup department. Other places call it production or layout. They then produce a new version, and we have another layer of proofreaders that's like a safety net that compares my reader's proof against the new version to make sure that I didn't enter any mistakes. And then, then we hope that it's ready to print. If you just joined us, here's truly Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck of Lewis at Large Radio. We're talking to Mary Norris, a uh, good one here. She is an editor for the New Yorker magazine. I believe she called it, reserved herself. Is it Gould Editor? Is that right? Well, what I, one of the things I do is called Goulding. Goulding. I think She's that Goulding. the term people might recognize is query proofreader. Qu- query proofreader, okay. Right. There's a brand new work that she has called Between You and Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen. It begs the question, um, to do what you do, yeah, you do have the advantage. There are there are things like spell check and all those various things. We are also very aware the New Yorker has a unique style of writing and editing. But I'm curious as to how much, how did you acquire such a knowledge of grammar, of the English language, of punctuation? How does that happen? And it does, at some point, does someone hit you over the head with a bottle of champagne and say, you're ready, or do you grow into that? Oh, <laughs> I wish somebody would hit me over the head with a bottle of champagne. <laughs> no, it definitely a lifelong learning process. I was always interested in books. I always loved books, and I always read. And I always like the nuts and bolts of things. Maybe it's my blue-collar streak. But I always noticed how it was done. For instance, I, I think I say this in the book, when I first read books, I knew I wanted to write a book someday, but I thought it was going to be hard to make each line even on the right side of the page, and I thought that was the writer's job, (laughs) to make it all come out even at the margins. And, uh, you know, who knew that one day you would just be able to press a button that said justify (laughs) right, and that would happen. You know, one of the things I know that that is in this book is the phrase, you can't legislate language. And that that leads me to maybe a bigger question for you. Mm -hmm. Is... Is it fair to say that overall, and let's let, we'll confine the conversation to North America, America if you want, um, are we dumbing down on our knowledge and appreciation of, our, of punctuation, of grammar, of sentence structure, et cetera? And, and if we are, uh, do we, should we care? And if we should care, what do we do about it? Well, I don't think we're dumbing it down. I think that has been a perception every generation has about the generation that's coming up after it. You know, there's a lot of of, um, concern because 
texting and Twitter and Facebook and email that people don't have high enough standards. They don't apply the same standard to those things, to a text, say, as they do to a printed piece in a magazine or in a book. And that may be true, and if so, if we can, it's our job to raise the standards of Twitter and texting. But if it's not for print, if it's just, you know, a a message between friends, who cares if it's all lowercase and it leaves out the punctuation? Um, you really have to consider where it's going to appear and if it's going to be to appear in print. Of course, you want to bring it as close to perfection as you can. Do you work with writers? Are there writers that you work with um, that submit stories or whatever that demand that nothing be changed, meaning they want it the way they want it? Do you ever run into those kinds of situations? I would say that I used to feel that more in the early days. Uh, I I don't know why I don't feel it so much anymore. Those writers who would always demand that something not be touched, um, they're not usually very good writers. The best writers are very interested to get feedback on a piece before it's going to be published. You know, that's what we're here for. And I think that the writers who get defensive are the ones who are not very sure of themselves. When you have worked in a magazine a long time, when you've written for it, and when you've worked as in the editorial department of it, you figure out, after not too long, that things that appear in it are collaborations. A lot of writing, it will be a collaboration between the writer and the editor. The author still gets the credit for it. It's the author's voice. We do everything we can to make the author look good. So it is the author's piece, but it's been sifted and refined by a team of people. What is it in your, and again, this is a a big, big question, but just in general, in in the best way that you can, what is it that makes The New Yorker uh, the unique magazine that it is? What is it that makes it stand out or at least stand apart from the others? The cartoons, of course. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> they have, there is a wonderful formula that includes cartoons, and, you know, even after 30, 40 years at The New Yorker, when I receive my copy on Monday, I go through it to look at the cartoons, just like anyone else who receives The New Yorker. And ap- apart from that, we have access. I, I don't know if we have access. That's perhaps not the right word, but... Some of the best writers alive want to be published in The New Yorker and are published in The New Yorker, both fiction and nonfiction, as well as criticism and short journalism and long-form journalism. There are a lot of good writers out there, and we have, we are able, I don't know why I'm saying we, because I don't pay them, but (laughs) the magazine is able to pay them well and to get good work out of them, and to give them the space they need to tell the story. Our editor right now, David Remnick, is from the newspaper world, so he's very intent on publishing pieces that are timely. I would say that the thing that has marked David's tenure here was 9-11, when maybe we... After 9-11, the New Yorker had a mission. You know, we were... We were going to cover important things like that. And, of course, we were we who work here were all grateful that there was something for us to do right after 9-11 to help put out a magazine that next week. What about uh, the, this whole, the, the whole new world, not new anymore, but over the last decade, the emergence uh, of online publishing, the emergence of online publications of magazines like the New Yorker, these the online editions. How has that changed not only the magazine's perspective and sense of itself, but also your job uh, as an editor? Well, we run so much on the web, and every place you know, there is so much out there on the web that it's impossible for us to give it the same kind of attention that we give to individual pieces that run in the print magazine. We started out trying, but it just couldn't be done. The kind of um, 
give and take that takes place between the editor and the proofreader and then the editor and the writer. Um, there was not time for that because there's something new on the website every every 10 minutes, if not more often. So that department now has its own group of copy editors, and they do their best, but they don't have the experience that comes from having done this for 20, 30 years, which the rest of us, which the ones, the people who work on the print side still have. But it's still, you know, it's wonderful. It's cracked everything open. It's given people, it's given writers more chances to be published and I hope they're getting paid for it. I believe they are getting paid better for it than they used to. It, you know, it's, it's not for free. You're not supposed to be giving it away. Um, but one of the things that happened for me was that when I started writing for the web, I wrote a piece about commas in response to a piece by Ben Yagoda in the New York Times that made fun of New Yorker commas. And that was my breakthrough as a writer, that piece on the web. So I'm all for it. Okay. Uh, what about uh, what about younger people? Are there young people lining up to be editors and doing the work that you do right now for the New Yorker? Yes, there are. I'm happy to say that there are some very talented young people, and it sometimes surprises me that they really are interested in editing. They study. They want to see what um, the what the senior proofreaders are doing. They look for our proofs to look at them. That's how we learned when I was coming up. There was a thing called the junk box. And when Eleanor Gould or Lou Burke, who was the other crack proofreader here, when they were through with their proofs, those proofs would go into this junk box, and we would sort through them and study them and see what they did and learn from that. And the kids here are still doing that. We don't have quite so much junk because it's not as centralized a process as it was because of the use of the computer. But you know, I've seen people with my book on their desk, which is very flattering, <laughs> and they are <laughs> trying to learn. What about, uh, what is a, uh, let's go a little more global, let's take it outside the New Yorker, but if, if, if Mary Norris were to look at a thousand letters people write to one another people assuming people still actually write letters from time to time to one another or mm-hmm. write papers what what is sort of a common uh error grammatical error that you see still and you, you drives you crazy What's i guess it? the thing that drives me craziest is right in the title of of the book between <laughs> you and me one of the age-old mistakes, I thought I discovered this mistake, (laughs) was the use of I. You know when kids are growing up and their mother tells them, don't say me and Jimmy, it's Jimmy and I. Well, that lesson got learned a little too well, so that people are now afraid to use the word me. And there's a grammatical reason that pronouns following a preposition like between or pronouns that are the object or indirect object of a verb like take me, um, those are in the objective case. That's me, you, him, her, us, them. The nominative case, the subjective case, is the one that's used for now for um, the subject of the sentence. Like I took him to basketball practice. I is in the subjective or nominative case. I, you, he, she, we, they, and of course you is the same in all of them. And I took him. Him is in the objective case, and that you would never say I took he to basketball practice. So when those kind of pronouns follow a preposition like between, they also take the objective case. So you would never say uh, between I and you. You would say between me and you, and then if you wanted it to be polite, you would say between you and me. So I'm hoping that just by looking at the title of the book, people will learn that. Wow. You know what? People, uh, you are learning. You are, there's always something to learn new on this radio show, and Mary Norris has given us something new to think about. All right, question for you. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and it involves the title of your book. Your book is entitled Between You and Me. There is an ampersand there versus mm-hmm. the word and. Explain to us and tell us in Mary Norris's no uncertain terms, when are we allowed to use an ampersand and when should we spell out the word A-N-D? Well, I think that the ampersand is a design feature. You know, when my publisher wanted to put use an ampersand instead of the word and, many years ago I might have objected, but I was not in a position to object for one thing, but I think it looks beautiful. The ampersand used to be the 27th letter of the alphabet. It used to follow Z, and it's an abbrevi- it's a symbol that means et cetera, basically. It means and everything else, and. And so it does have its own pedigree as a letter of the alphabet. And I would say, though, that its use should be limited to design typography, or we also use it, the New Yorker goes ahead and uses it when a, a business firm uses an ampersand, like Best and Company, B-E-S-T, ampersand, C-O, point, you know, period. So um, we follow the style of the business or the firm, and if they prefer an ampersand for design reasons, we will give it to them. Mary, was this uh, was this book easy to write, or was this one that you just sort of started and you sort of add to it along the way? Did it take a long time, or was it pretty quick to put it together? Well, it took two years, which doesn't sound like that long in retrospect, but it felt like 20 years. Okay. It was very hard to organize the material. You know, I had plenty of material, and I had plenty of things that I could say. I could look up a word in a dictionary, and it would send me on a little tour of other places in the dictionary, but that wasn't that interesting to the general reader, you know, so <laughs> I had to find things that would would make a point and would entertain at the same time, so it was, it was important that it not be boring, and that was a little hard for me was when my editor said, boring, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and something would just disappear from the piece. I did some traveling for the piece, hoping that would liven it up. And you know, I went to the home of Herman Melville in um, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, called Arrowhead. Uh-huh. And I went to visit the birthplace of Noah Webster in West Hartford, Connecticut. And the places themselves were maybe, you know, there were little museums. And you don't describe everything that happened to you there because that would be boring. But you find something that resonated that resonates and then your editor takes out everything that doesn't apply to that is how it works so well I wrote it, a lot more than actually it, appears in the book <laughs> the work is called between you and me confessions of a comma queen uh by mary norris she is an editor uh, at the New Yorker, uh, a long uh, career doing a wide variety of things, but for the last uh, three decades or so, she's been at the New Yorker and has been a good one. Uh, it's a fascinating read. It is published uh, by Norton, I believe, yeah, Norton Press. And uh, Mary, how can people find out more about Mary Norris and your thoughts on the English language and also pick up a copy of the book? Well, they could visit my website, which is net. And that they can be led to the various places where the book can be pre-ordered. The book will be available for sale on April 6th. That's my publication date. It would also be of interest, perhaps, to people to visit newyorker.com, where my they have archived some of my essays, my early work on my blog posts on grammar and usage, and they're also instituting a video series where I teach about grammar, and there's lots of wonderful stuff on the website. All right. Well, you're just you're we're just catching you now at your rock star phase. I can tell. So uh, that's uh, <laughs> good. Listen, thank you so much for being a part uh, of our show today, and uh, best of luck to you in the future for sure. Thank you so much, Warren. You bet. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. <laughs> 